welcome to Women's Sweet on Women, Black Lesbian Film Festival. Zami Noble is thrilled to work with Alloin Film and Sisters in Cinema in partnership with Third World Newsreel, Beyond Bold and Brave, Black Lesbians United, and AARP Georgia to host our very first virtual mini film festival commemorating the life and legacy of warrior poet Audrey Lloyd and centering the work of Black lesbian filmmakers. My name is Mary Ann Adams, founder and executive director of Zami Nobla, National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging. Deeply rooted in Atlanta, Georgia, with state chapters in California, North Carolina, and Oregon, we are committed to building a base of power for Black lesbians over the age of 40 living anywhere in the country. We center service, advocacy, and community-engaged research. Please visit us at www.zaminobla.org. I am absolutely thrilled to be able to moderate this talk back with award-winning filmmaker Shelley Berry. Shelley was awarded a full scholarship from the Ford Foundation to study toward her Master's of Fine Art and Film in the United States and graduated from Temple University in Philadelphia in 2006. Her films span across genres and are largely experimental in style. She often shoots her own films, exploring the aesthetics of cinematography, from the perspective of a wheelchair user. Screenings of her work have been held at major festivals and events around the world and acquired by television, including MTV, DUTV, and WYBE in the US, and SABC and ETV in South Africa. New York University is one of the international libraries that has purchased her work. Awards include a, a Zami or Lord Scholarship for Film Production, Distinguished Graduate Student Award from the Pennsylvania Association of Graduate Schools, and Best Film Awards at international festivals in New York City, Canada, Moscow, San Francisco, Toronto, Philadelphia, New Jersey, for her first film, an experimental documentary titled Hold, A Trinity of Being. Her thesis film, Where We Planted Trees, was awarded Best Documentary at the Diamond Screen Film Festival in Philadelphia and selected for the Encounter South African International Film Festival in 2011. Inclinations, executive produced by Cheryl Dunye, was acquired by MTV and made the top 10 best click lists on their online site. ETV commissioned Diaries of a Dissident Poet on Port James Matthews, which was broadcast nationally in 2019. Shelley Berry, wow, how accomplished you are. It is such a pleasure to talk to you today. You just don't know. We are so grateful to have you in this film festival. I guess this makes us an international film festival, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how amazing. Yes. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. You. All right, here we go. Thank you for having me. <laughs> of course. So, Shelly, um, in reviewing your story and body of work in preparation for this talk back, I was struck by the immense highs and lows you've experienced in your life, the fight in you your will to survive and thrive and the reinvention of your life, if you will, on so many levels. Where does this come from? The fight in me? Yes. <laughs> uh, I guess, Mary Ann, I was raised by a tribe of really strong women. Um, and, and I think that's where, with, you know, growing up with a lot of love and a lot of belief in the power of women and the strength of women. And I think that has always buoyed me in difficult times. Uh, my mom especially is the kind of person that would say to me when I was in hospital, really depressed and miserable, um, you know, stop feeling sorry for yourself. But yes, I know this is hard, but you know, you're still alive. Um, and life goes on and, and you're still going to do great things. and. I was kind of hard to hear at the time because I just wanted a lot of sympathy. 
But in retrospect, um, you know, I also needed to hear that, you know, to hear that even though I was never going to walk again, um, that that there was life. There was life after after the shooting and that I was not allowed to give up on my dreams, um, which I subsequently haven't. And thank God for that. Yeah. I shudder to think of, of the other alternatives. Um, you know, so... So I think I think the women in my life have been a huge influence. Yes. Yes. So we're going to put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to that. Uh, you were born in 1971 in South Africa doing the, the brutal legalized uh, racial segregation called apartheid, uh, where your movement was restricted, much like my movement was restricted growing up in the racial segregated southern state of Mississippi. Uh, you talked about growing up as an only child in a big extended family, you know, anchored by the women, your grandmothers, your mother. How aware were you of this institutionalized system of racial segregation when you were growing up? I was always, I was very aware of it from a, from a really young age because my family would speak about it, firstly, um, and were extremely critical of the apartheid government. And also I was aware that you know, uh, that I couldn't go various places, that our, our movement, as you were talking about, the restriction of movement, that um, we weren't allowed to go to certain areas, we weren't allowed to go to certain beaches, certain schools, everything, our entire infrastructure um, uh, was limited. Um, and also my, my mother's family, both my parents' families were both forcibly removed um, during the Group Areas Act. Um, so I was always very aware of it. Uh, and obviously it shaped your life and your choices and your, your access to opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, obviously growing, growing up, getting older, you become more politically conscious and, and more aware. Um, but it was something I just, I was raised with in a way, you know. Um, and, and feel very grateful that in my lifetime, I saw the end of, well, institutional apartheid, let's put it that way. And, uh, you know, that I had the opportunity to meet Mandela and to work in a democratic parliament um, briefly for two years. Um, but yeah, my, uh, my, my grandmother only saw a smidgen of that, like one year of democracy, you know, so. That's yeah. a, an amazing trajectory when you think about it. I mean, the fact that you were yeah. born in 71 against this backdrop of apartheid and then in the 90s, early 90s, just future of South Africa held all this tremendous promise. I mean, you had, you know, after decades of this legalized, brutal uh, apartheid, racial segregation, then Nelson Mandela is free from prison. Uh, the ban on the ANC, the African National Congress is lifted. Um, and then the negotiations for this new constitution uh, commences. Uh, and then in 1994, Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as president of South Africa. Uh, and you, in the meantime, you're thriving. Uh, you know, you're the scholar. I mean, you're getting these degrees. I mean, it's just tremendous when you think about it, Shelley. And then, you know, January 1996, you're 23 years old. Uh, you just finished your graduate degree. You're on your way to a job interview. Mm -hmm. um, and then this tragedy happened. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, I, was, I was living in Cape Town at the time and, you know, I didn't have my own car. I traveled by public transport, which in South Africa till this day is the minibus taxi industry, which is very unregulated and continues to be a site of violence for many of the commuters that rely on, on that travel. So on that particular day, I was on my way to a job interview, my first job after university, after graduating. And when we came to a, um, a streetlight, um, um, another taxi kind of pulled up right next to us and opened fire. Um, and he was targeting the driver. 
um, but he was also shooting quite randomly. So um, the driver was killed and I was sitting right next to him. Um, and one of the bullets hit my spine um, and that was it. Um, I was paralyzed. Um, I, found, I knew immediately, actually my body knew immediately. Um, and then in hospital, they also, they put my, I, I couldn't breathe because my lungs were, um, they were both, you know, collapsed. So they put a trachea in, but they put it in the wrong place. So subsequent to that, I also live with a permanent tracheostomy. Um, so 25 years now, uh, which is why I always wear beautiful jewelry. Yes, you do. <laughs> you protect it, um, you know. Um, yeah, so, so that's what happened that particular day. And I was with my partner at the time. She was also shot, um, but luckily not. Um, not in a, as and in as a serious condition and I, as I was. Um, she was released from hospital shortly after. Um, but she literally still carries the bullet in her sternum, um, the bullet that came through me into her body. So, um, yeah, it was crazy. We were young. Um, it was quite an adjustment to life, let me say, the, you know. Um, but, but, you know... <laughs> I went through the necessary grief and the depression, um, but I also knew that I had to ultimately make a choice um, and and live my life or just be sorry for myself or be depressed for, for the rest of my life. And I was, I was not prepared to do that. So, sure. um, but that's what happened that day. Um, to answer your question. <laughs> well, I'm curious, when you go through that kind of uh, life-changing tragedy with someone else, are you all still friends? Does that bond you for life? Is that a certain type of, of friendship, relationship? I I'm curious about that. Well, we, you know, we, we were, uh, our relationship took a knock. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, suddenly she was with a disabled person and that's hard. Um, and then eventually, <coughs> sorry, mm -hmm. we broke up. Mm -hmm. um, but we're friends today. Sorry, Mary, I need to pause. No, no, no take your time. It's okay. <coughs> I've got some dust in my throat. Yes. Yeah, so, but we, we're very good friends today. Very, yeah. very good. So we just took a bit of time out. Um, after we broke up and and then eventually just became friends again. So, yeah, I guess that, of course, that bonds you for life. Yes, yes, I can um, imagine. And we do have quite a quite a close friendship, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Well, so here you are, you're 23 years old. You, you spent four months in the hospital. Um, you just talked about an attitude shift. You know, you went through, of course, depression, uh, wondering if your life was over. And then nine months later, Shelley, you're taking a job in Parliament with Nelson Mandela as his first disability coordinator. I mean, and, 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 and you know, you talked about being in the hospital and having your grandmother having died uh, sometime before that and her coming to you. And you said something that really struck me, Kelly. You said that it was her life pouring. It was life pouring from her life to yours. Yes. I mean, that's such an incredible image. Um, and it really yes. speaks to your, your spirituality. It speaks to your faith. Now, I'm somebody who identifies as a heathen. So for me <laughs> to be struck by that was just amazing. But, but the image, it just really struck me. And, and, and the, the poetic way, but of course, you, you know, you speak poetically anyway. But the poetic way that you said, you know, she, 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 she was there with her arms outstretched, I think. And it was her life pouring from her life to mine. That's, can you talk about that uh, for our listeners? Because that's a, a very powerful image, um, and and I know a lot of people who are spiritual uh, can relate to that, and it resonates with them. So I just want you to speak about that for for a second, if you will. 
So I had a near death experience um, when I was uh, I was di- you know I was dying and if the doctors confirmed I was dying the priests were there priest gave me my last rites and all of that um, and in that time I traveled out of my body and I do believe I went to heaven um, because I saw my ancestors. Um, I saw the room from above before I disappeared into another dimension. Um, I could describe the room to people and they were amazed because I was really like I was out of it. Um, and and then I just felt sort of, you know, life leaving my body and being in this other dimension. And it, it's everything that people say it is like, it's 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 so it's more um, about being surrounded by love. That's mm-hmm. the feeling. Um, and and then I saw my grandmother above my above my body, um, sort of streaming light into into me, sort of giving me a life force. And of course, my grandmother had passed just the year before, and we were very close. And for some reason, um, I came back. I remember negotiating, and it's not in words, so it's very difficult to describe. It's not in words. I negotiated that it's not my time. I'm not going now. <laughs> I've got things to do. But it wasn't in words. It was like an exchange on some level or the other. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was alive. And I was back, and the doctors can't up to this day figure out how I survived because they have no medical explanation for it. Um, And I believe that I had a spiritual experience. I really do. It's amazing. So here you are, you go work with this larger than life figure. (laughs) Uh, I mean, you never worked as a disability coordinator before. You never worked in parliament before. You never worked for Nessa Mandela before. I mean, what what made you think you could do that, Shelly? Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, naivety, maybe. <laughs> I think I was just so desperate for for some, you know, to turn a corner. And I saw the ad for that job. It was like a tiny little ad in the newspaper, and I thought, man, I'm just gonna try, you know. Um, and I could even barely even talk at the time, to be honest with you. <laughs> My voice was, 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 was very badly damaged. Um, but I think I went in there with such passion that they were like, oh, shame, man, we're going to give this child a shot. <laughs> you know, um, and, and what I had in my favor was that I could write. And they were looking for someone who, who could write. Yes. Um, and so that helped a lot. <laughs> um, and that's, you know, everything changed from there. My political consciousness changed around disability and the way I viewed it. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, everything was just different from, from I met lots of amazing people, fellow comrades, uh, was very involved in, in disability politics and policies and the movement and and you know that just swept me into a whole different direction mm. um, for a while yeah well you know uh since eight years old uh when your mama took you to see annie you wanted to be a filmmaker you dreamt of being a filmmaker you sort of put that aside uh, to go out to university and you majored in english and i think you you did some film work as well uh, yeah. But you sort of thought, you know, this was not practical. You need to go and be a teacher. Um, and you were on your way to that job interview. Um, but after working in Parliament, you took that dream up again, Shelley. Was it being in those movements, being around Mandela Singh? You know, did that um, empower you to chase your dream? It did. It definitely did. And I was obviously exposed to so many opportunities. Um, and to people who told me about opportunities and everyone knew about my dream to become a filmmaker. Um, you know, I was given the option of becoming a member of parliament, um, representing the disability community. 
but I didn't, I knew that I wanted to make films and I, I said, no, don't, don't, don't put me up as a, as an option because I want to make films. And I remember they laughed at me and they were like, you've never made a film in your life. What are you talking about? <laughs> but I just knew that like, I was never going to be fulfilled if I didn't explore that. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I just knew that I, it's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So how did it happen? I mean, how did you prepare yourself for that, Shelley? Um, how did you get the funding? How did you get, can you talk to us a bit about that process, please? Okay, yeah, so a friend of mine um, told me about a Ford Foundation scholarship. Uh, at the time, Ford Foundation were targeting black leaders to study internationally at any university in the world, in any field that they wanted to. And that was it. I applied. It was a long process, you know, many layers and levels and to it, many interviews. Um, and, and that's how I landed up at Temple in Philadelphia with Michelle Parkinson and Cheryl Daniel as my teachers. I wow. was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, two of the uh, renowned black lesbian filmmakers, and here you are again, Shelly, you end up having them <laughs> as your teachers. I mean, and most amazing. And they really, you know, they nurtured me. They nurtured me and they were there for me. And they really encouraged me to, to make my work. You know, um, so I, I can't, they were such an, in fact, I'm writing about them. Don't, they don't even know about it yet. Oh, wow. Amazing. About them in, uh, in, in, in um, I'm doing a, my PhD in film at the moment and um, reflecting on, you know, cinematic practice from the side of a wheelchair and all of that. And th those two women were so absolutely influential in, in my entire sort of trajectory and career. So uh, I'm, I, I'm honoring them as they should be honored. Um, you know, I spoke to you before we came on camera about the fact that Michelle's film, A Litany for Survival, is in this film festival and how highly she spoke of you uh, as her student and just how incredibly talented you are are and you were at the time and we've certainly seen that in, in, in all of your subsequent work uh was hold the first film that you made shelly yes yes it was yes. <laughs> to to make whole a trinity of being to write that to direct that uh to have that be your first film and and by now for those of you listening to this talk back, you've probably seen it. Um, you see the genius of it. Uh, you know it's an experimental documentary that it's a docu-poem uh, reclaiming life after trauma and that it's a film that contains three shorts. But what's remarkable about this is you, people laughed at you and said, you know, you can't make a film. You've never made a film. Why do you think you could be a filmmaker? You make your first film, Shelley. And it gets best film at Superfest California. It gets best narrative short at the Philadelphia Festival of Independence. It gets best experimental film at Breaking Barriers Festival in Moscow, Russia. It gets best experimental film projections too in Canada. It gets Spirit of Independent Award in Brooklyn, New York, the Inter International Disability Film Festival. It gets the Jewel Citation Award, Black Maria Film Festival in New Jersey. It gets the Outstanding Grand Graduate Student Award, Pennsylvania Association of Graduate Schools. It gets a scholarship from us for the, for the, from the Orange <laughs> Lord Scholarship Award for Media Production. You get the television acquisition um, in, in WYBE, DUTV, wow. uh, community these TV stations in the U.S., SABC, SA, the yeah. International Festival Screenings. I mean, oh, such a blessing. Shelly, I mean, this is, I mean, did you, were you prepared for this? Did you have any idea that this was going to do and, and talk to us about your decision-making process to turn the camera lens on yourself. 
I wasn't prepared. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. <clears throat> but I think, well, actually, the first film that I made of the trilogy was Entry, which is the third in the, mm-hmm. in the sequence that you see. And that was made for a class with Cheryl Dunier. Um, it was a, a cinematography class. Um, and I made this short and, and Cheryl really loved it. And she was like, I'm sending this to the San Francisco International Film Festival. Okay, <laughs> wow. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, and, and, and she really encouraged me. And, she, and we had missed the deadline. I remember the deadline had passed. And she called someone up and they're like, you have to see this work. And there it was. The next thing I was sitting in the Castro, talking in the Castro, I was in heaven. <laughs> Seriously in heaven. So why, did, you know, well, various reasons. I wanted, to, I wanted to tell the story, you know, the personal story of the shooting. And I'd, I'd started sort of writing scripts about it, but I had not found the language um, of, of, of how I was going to uh, tell the story. And then Michelle Parkinson <laughs> um, introduced me, well, my class, to the work of Marlon Riggs, mm. uh, to, um, to the work of Stan Brackage, uh, but particularly Marlon Riggs was, was a very big influence. Um, Maya Darren, all these experimental filmmakers and, um, and and that definitely influenced influenced the style. So I just literally started playing, and not thinking too much about how I'm going to tell it, but sort of just putting something together. And then I would show either Cheryl or Michelle, and you know they would guide me, and you know they were just so encouraging. They said, "Wow, this is keep going." I just remember Michelle saying, "Make more." <laughs> <laughs> more of this <laughs> and so I did and that's how it ended up being a trilogy because I was just following her orders to make more um, <clears throat> yeah, so. you know the work is so vulnerable and it's so authentic and it is so honest in the it's storytelling and you know the first time I saw it when you said it in you know you want to turn away but you can't I mean literally, you really cannot I mean it's the first time that that we really see the representation and the visibility of, of disability in that way um and I the the writing is so lyrical, it's so poetic. And I remember uh, in my research, a friend of yours said that Shelley speaks to you in pictures. And I can absolutely see that, Shelley, because not only is the, the cinematography and the, the writing, but but the, the, the writing is it's just the, the combination of all of that. Uh, it's just tremendous. I mean, your work is tremendous because the writing, the, the way that you you could really just even if you were not a filmmaker, you could just be a poet and a writer, seriously, <laughs> because your writing is that good. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this time okay. again. Very sweet, but really. it's true. But when you compare that, I mean, the writing is just, I mean, I speak because I have to. I mean, my god, <laughs> it's just tremendous kind of writing. Uh, I'm sure that they were excited to get you as a student. I cannot imagine Very teachers good. live for this kind of student. This kind of student comes along once in a lifetime, <laughs> oh, no, no. but they were just they were very nurturing. Um, and and they're the best, you know, kind of teacher that you can hope to, to find. And for me, as a, as a black lesbian, to be to be affirmed in that way, you know, by having lecturers who were out black lesbians, you know, that was phenomenal. That was extremely empowering, actually. You know? uh, yeah, I can imagine. So, do you have a ritual? That that you how do you prepare for a, making a film? Is there some kind of ritual? Do you go into yourself for a month beforehand, or do you meditate, or do you eat your favorite food, or do you? I mean, what do you do to prepare? Um, so yeah, <laughs> maybe you don't do anything. I don't know. Maybe I'm making this story up about you. <laughs> you kind of said it all. So. Um, 
I do, I do meditate uh, quite a bit. Um, you know, just just being in silence. I'm actually going into one of those um, stages now, where um, I, I'm in isolation. Um, well, with this COVID, of course, as well. Um, but I live alone with my cat. I don't know where she is. She's up around and about somewhere. <laughs> Um, but then I prepare, I tell my friends, you know, just for a while, you may not see me. <laughs> um, and then it's about rising early, meditating, um, you know, having very specific nutrition. Um, it's just about silence, about just becoming quiet. Um, and then reading and writing, trying to do that every day. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that the university has given me some time off, uh, <laughs> some teaching relief while I'm writing, uh, which is which is a huge blessing, really a huge blessing. Um, but I do have those rituals. I, I, I'm not the kind of person that can create in chaos. I need to pay very, very good attention to my inner state, to, dream, to dreams. Um, I need to be nurtured and inspired by other writers. Um, and, um, yeah, and I need to just try and, and sit with a page every day, um, you know, so, so that's what I, I've actually started today with that, with that process, clean your apartment, <laughs> laundry, <clears throat> cook vegan food. I am vegetarian, but when I want to go really deep, uh, I go vegan for a mm. while. Mm-hmm. Um, and all that kind of stuff. Like I need those kind of structures in order to create. Um, um, yeah. So 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 that's that's what I did then, and, and and that's what I'm in the process of doing at the moment. So we'll see what comes. Oh, I can't wait to see. Uh, so so Shelley, um, we live in a world where there's a lot of structural oppressions, and particularly when it comes to disability. Uh, my partner is legally blind and she is an ukulele teacher um, and musician. Uh, she also is a graphic design artist and all of the graphics is graphic behind me. This is her work. Um, and I see firsthand the discrimination um, that she faces and she's the most brilliant person I know. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can just recount a bit your experience as a wheelchair user, filmmaker out in the world where there's so many structural uh, issues, particularly around disability um, and, 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 and what you face in terms of making your films, those structural issues, those oppression. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, first of all, I wanna quote, actually quote Audrey Lord from the trailer of 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 uh, of uh, a litany for survival, where she says, "I started writing because I saw a need to write about something that was not there," um, and 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 that's how I feel about about disability. And when I crossed over into that parallel universe of being a person with a disability. Um, I, I, I was very aware of the invisibility. I was very aware of the oppression. I was very aware of the architecture of apartheid, um, which exists, right, you know, as we speak, because we do not live in an accessible environment, not only in South Africa, but in most of the world. Um, you are seen as invisible for the most part. You are patronized um, and you're not really considered necessary to be um, a valuable member of society and uh, even in activist circles. And I'm always shocked and amazed how like the feminists and the yes. lesbian activists and, you know, the political activists will still, they can't cross over to seeing disability in a human rights framework. Um, so, yeah, so, 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 it's not easy, but obviously you have to get out there and do your thing and make your work and build community and, um, and, and you know, 
to my work, I try to my films. I've made a, a recent film that you, you haven't seen. It's a virtual reality film uh, where artists with disabilities transform Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> Accessible galaxy. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, you know, so so it's almost like you you know you have to kind of find ways for people to make a connection um, because there's a lot of ignorance that's still pervasive. Um, and and the other thing that I do is I try and train as far as possible train young people with disabilities um, to make films. So, you know, because there's so few of us and, and, and you know, we, we're not getting any younger. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to pass on and, you know, you know, encourage people to be in charge of the representation of their images. Um, so, yeah, but it's a long fight and it's a fight that needs to be fought with, with everyone, you know. <laughs> um, and unless people start to see those connections and feel, you know, be part of that community and not only feel that it's only persons with disabilities that need to fight for their rights. It's going to be a long haul. It's going to be a really long haul. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> Can you excuse me for like 10 seconds? Absolutely. I'm just wheeling. Just going to go put the light on. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's the sun is setting now. So. Kind of getting in the dark. Yes. <clears throat> so that's better. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. No problem. Better. Okay. Uh, so here's a quote by Shelley Berry. <laughs> the process of reclaiming my body was an exceptionally powerful and liberating experience. I understood desire and sensuality from a completely different perspective. I realized that passion is something that everyone can access. It is not reserved for the young and the able-bodied, able and it can suffuse through every aspect of our lives. I recognize the importance of self-love as opposed to requiring affirmation from others in order to love myself. I love this quote, Shelley. It really sent shivers down my spine. And it for forever. <laughs> and it reminds me of that Orja Lord essay, Uses of the Erotic. And the one thing that she says, quote, is as women, we need to examine the ways in which our world can be truly different. I am speaking here of the, of the necessity for reassessing the quality of all the aspects of our lives and of our work and of how we move toward and through them. When I speak of the erotic, then I speak of it as an assertion of the life force of women, of that creative energy empowered the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, and our lives. Wow. This brings me to pants, shirt, and lipstick, which is also shown at our festival. <laughs> this is about queer couples and their friends who plot this night of fooling immigration for this green card during the presidency of George Bush. Um, in May 1996, you know, South Africa was the first jurisdiction in the world to provide constitutional protections for LGBTQ people. Um, the, the Constitution disallows discrimination on race, gender, sexual orientation, and other grounds. But we still hear about this violence and this social discrimination against South African LGBTQ people that is still widespread and is fueled by uh, a number of religions and political figures. Um, and so a lot of the sub subject in your work deals with um, LGBTQ relationships, love, passion. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, Shelley, how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Safe you feel in telling these stories and doing your work 
uh, as an out black lesbian in South Africa, having your work shown all over the world, being a very public figure. Um, and I know this is, a, I'm saying a lot at one time. <laughs> Are you still following me? I, I know you can, you okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And, and so I get back to pants, shirt and lipstick and seldom do we witness the tenderness and the kisses on screen between mature black lesbians that does not lead to gratuitous sex. Um, so more of that, please. And I also found the male gaze interesting in that dynamic. So that's a lot to unpack. I know, but I'm I'm just I'm just wondering. You know, you you. I'm just wondering about. And I also know you're working with trans students right now. You're teaching them film. So I'm just wondering about all of that in the context of South Africa being the first, but still, I understand there's still a lot of widespread and you being this famous out black filmmaker. So can you talk about that? So I'm going to answer you with this quote. Okay. All right. I've had this for 20 years. Okay. Um, and it's, of course, Audrey Lord, And I have it, wherever I've traveled, I've had it. It's a bit like worn around the edges, but I sort of live by this. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. Mm, yes. So um, I, live, I live by this quote in terms of my work. Um, because the, the, the work is too important to be scared. Mm. Um, and yes, there are legitimate fears. Um, but I'm also very aware that, um, you know, I, I'm also, I have, I have protections of, um, you know, of living in certain places and of the way I now travel or, or, you know, et cetera, you know, I'm less vulnerable than, than many, many people. But obviously the fear is always there, but I, I don't think of it, to be honest with you. Um, um, I, I'm more, more my, my, my energy is placed in making sure that as many voices get out there, which is why I work with young people um, uh, across the board, um, LGBTQI, um, and, and, and youth with disabilities are, are my main sort of target target uh, youth that I work with. And not only youth, because it doesn't only have to be youth, right? I'm dying to work with elders. Um, and I have here and there in one or two projects. Um, but I just think that if we're not out there, if we're not speaking, then what's going to change? How will anything change? if we're all just going to be afraid. Um, and I guess that's, that's my perspective um, on, on that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. We, fear is natural and of course it's part of life, but you, you just can't just live your life with fear because then you're not even living. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, so in closing, um, as you know, Zami Noble is focused on increasing visibility and representation of older black lesbians. Yeah. We've seen you turn the camera on yourself as a young woman. Will we mm -hmm. see you turn the camera on yourself as an aging black lesbian? Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, I'm making a film right now. So, and I turned 50 in a few weeks um, and I'm excited actually to be aging. Um, it comes with, of course, a lot of other factors, <laughs> um, but, um, and I think, and that's why I really, I really admire the work that you're doing because I think the most painful part of aging is isolation. Yes. Uh, and by building community, the work that you're doing, you're countering that isolation and you're, you know, you're building those ties and uh, making people visible to one another in a world that is increasingly isolating, uh, especially in the COVID era. Um, so I really salute, 
salute, salute the work you do. And it, I hope that it gets all the support, all the money, all the, everything must come your way. Um, and I hope to visit uh, when the world is slightly less crazy. Please, we would love to have a retrospective of Shelley Berry's work in Atlanta, oh, Georgia. Right. Absolutely. Be- you have an open invitation anytime. We would love to have you. Uh, we can't wait to see what's next, Shelley. We cannot wait to see this amazing work. I, I, I know it's amazing. Uh, as Audre Lorde says, we have to be willing to nurture the creative work, even though it's yet unseen. I'm paraphrasing her, but it's something like that. So I cannot wait to see what's next for you. Uh, I'm so excited to have you in this film festival. Thank you for being so gracious with your time, uh, you know, giving us a glimpse into your filmmaking process, into your life, um, into how you traverse the world, and most importantly, uh, your bravery um, and your love for us, Shelley. Your love for 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 black LGBT folk putting us on the screen because we are not there often. So. No. Thank you. We appreciate because it's clear that you love us. It's absolutely clear that you love us. And I feel loved right back. And you are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.